Okay, so systolic heart failure is uh, by far the most common form of heart failure you're going to see and defined as an ejection fraction of less than 40%. So that's impaired ability of your ventricle to fill or eject blood, impaired cardiac wall motion. Um, Two-thirds of people attribute it to coronary artery disease. So ischemic cardiac myopathy is the, one of the most common forms of heart failure. So post-MI, post some sort of acute coronary syndrome, it's not uncommon to develop at least mild heart failure from that. So that's a big population of people that's going to go from that condition uh, to being relatively healthy, having a heart attack, and then all of a sudden being a heart failure patient. Um, about the other third comes from these things here. So hypertension being a big cause, thyroid disease, uh, valvular disease possibly, um, cardiotoxins, excessive alcohol, uh, medication, drug abuse, stuff like that, um, common uh, presentations. As my transplant coordinator says, um, heart failure is a lot of times the complication of people who have lived overly rich lives. I think that's simplifying a little bit, but that's what he says. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, diastolic heart failure is uh, not a super common. It's about 30% of patients. Ejection fraction is usually greater than 40 to 50%. Um, normal ejection fraction, by the way, is about 50, 50, 55 to 70%. So that's what we're looking at here. Impaired relaxation and filling of the ventricle you usually get normal wall motion, and this is more <laughs> likely caused by just chronic hypertension. It's a more common heart failure presentation for the elderly and people who just have long-standing hypertension that's been untreated for, for decades, but are otherwise relatively healthy, just mild hypertension building up and causing strain over the heart over a long period of time. Okay, uh, this just shows the difference in how the walls look in somebody with systolic versus diastolic dysfunction. So diastolic heart failure usually thick kind of fibrous walls, whereas systolic function, dysfunction usually get ballooning of the heart. So when I talk about remodeling, that's what this concept is, is um, when you hear remodeling in terms of heart failure, the idea is to get it from this balloon uh, looking thing back to something that looks more normal. Right? So you want those walls to tighten up, you want that muscle to build up and not be thin, and that's going to give you the function back. And that's what drugs can actually do. Okay, both share common types of symptoms, so both systolic and diastolic heart failure can cause dyspnea, fatigue, edema, and exercise intolerance. Those are the primary symptoms. Our goal is to improve these symptoms and ultimately um, reduce risk of morbidity and mortality. That includes hospitalizations and all-cause mortality. Staging heart failure, the um, ACCF, AHA stages versus the New York Heart, heart Association, Functional classifications are very, very similar. Um, they just stratify them differently as far as what they assign them, their, their letter or their Roman numeral. So really, um, a type, an A person or a not, or none, according to this, would be somebody with structural heart disease, without structural heart disease, but they're just at high risk. So does that mean they maybe have, uh, maybe they're an alcoholic patient or maybe they have chronic hypertension, something like that. Um, B or 1 is lim no limitation on physical activity. Ordinary physical activity does not cause symptoms of heart failure, but they have some sort of structural heart disease. So this is a person who's kind of at the borderline. You don't really treat these people. There's no real recommendation for that. And then once you get into C or categories, this is where New York differs. They categorize it out as far as um, the different symptomatic uh, uh, stratifications there. But ultimately, it's the same thing. C and then 1, 2, and 4. Well, one through four, I should say, are uh, really where you're going to see treatment um, when it comes to recommendations. Okay, I see you guys all have this pamphlet, right? This is the same thing that I just put up here. Is it the same thing? I think so. I peeked at one of yours while I was getting ready. Pretty much. Um, so this should be helpful when studying, I hope. Uh, I think it shows pretty much where all the evidence is, and it reinforces what you need to have a heart failure patient on. So I've already said this probably like five times, but heart failures need to be on ACE inhibitors, um, and beta blockers. Now, the question is, what happens if they can't be on one of those, or how do you maximize those, and what, when do you use some of the other medications? So let's talk about that stuff here. Oh, this stuff I'm not going to cover, um, but I will just mention it briefly since it's drug-related. Statins, we'll do a really brief, like a 10-slide statin intro um, for next week. I'll record that. And we'll talk more about statins during endocrine in detail about evidence and stuff like that. But um, just for benefit of heart failure, prescribing a statin to lower cholesterol or manage cholesterol is probably a good idea, but doesn't have any actual impact on heart failure patients. So no benefit there. It doesn't mean you can't prescribe it, but it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids have some weak evidence, which is interesting. I didn't think they had any evidence, but there is maybe some mild evidence there. Yes? Don't heart failure patients have like a problem with like cirrhosis? If they're alcoholics, maybe. Generally, no. They should, they should have 
Well, unless they have some other pathophysiology going on, they should have healthy livers. Mm -hmm. Yep, it all depends on what their risk is. If they're post MI, they're definitely going to be on a statin. That's a requirement. So, uh, okay, omega three fatty acids is a supplement. Really popular, fish like everyone in the hospital, I swear, is on a fish oil supplement. Um, there is there's controversial evidence. I'll say that um, from what I've read, I, I'm not convinced. But according to them, they give it a little bit of a bump as far as evidence quality. I don't know. Um, and then there's other things. Basically, they've looked at a number of other nutritional supplements, hormonal therapies, things like that. They've shown that they either cause no benefit or harm. So really, this is kind of the core of heart failure treatment. So that's all I'm going to talk about about these other ones. We talked about calcium channel blockers with respect to heart failure already. Okay, pathophys... Uh, where am I here? Did I reorganize my slides? Oh, there it is. Okay, left ventricular dysfunction. Function. So we have neurohormonal activation. Uh, in the form of increases in amounts of norepinephrine, angiotensin II, vasopressin, endothelium, tumor necrosis alpha, and aldosterone. All those things lead to kind of the, the perfect picture for heart failure. So you're getting a lot of uh, problems with the heart being able to, to pump correctly due to problems with afterload and preload. So we'll talk about how we can affect those with drugs. And a lot of that has to do with how the, the, the hormones that are being activated through the body's endogenous pathways are manipulating the blood vessels. Um, three major body systems affected. So we've got the heart, of course, blood vessels, and the kidneys being a big part of that. The following effects are seen. So uh, increased demands on the heart further increases neurohormonal activation. So it's a vicious cycle. Once you start developing heart failure, it's hard for your body to get back on top of it. Eventually, you'll just get to the point where your, your heart can't function correctly anymore. Um, peripheral vasoconstriction. So you're trying to shunt blood to the core to support your heart. That causes an increase in ballooning, and the ventricles can't pump all that extra fluid. Um, so anyway, some other things, sodium retention, myocardial fibrosis are other things seen. Systemic factor correction, thyroid infection, diabetes, COP, sleep apnea, those can all be comorbid conditions that should be managed appropriately. Smoking cessation, alcohol restriction, salt restriction are all big things for, um, for heart failure patients. Where salt restriction is maybe a little bit of a weak recommendation for a hypertensive patient, probably a good recommendation, but maybe not like end all be all. Um, it is really important for heart failure patients because fluid accumulation can, can really exacerbate their illness. I can put a patient in a hospital really quick. So they do really have to have some sort of probably nutritional education on board, whether it's a dietitian or a, a, you know, a certified nurse or something like that. Weight reduction in OB subjects with the goal of being 10% of ideal body weight is great, but difficult to do, especially if your patient can't exercise because they have heart failure. So probably going to be unrealistic for a lot of patients until you can get them optimized and maybe tolerate some light exercise. Um, daily weight monitoring to detect fluid accumulation before it becomes symptomatic. Um, that's really important for heart failure patients to be able to weigh themselves and to have a plan in place for what they do if their weight accumulates suddenly. Just like our COPD patients, we want our CHF patients to also get vaccinated. They are at higher risk for respiratory disorder, for respiratory infections like pneumococcal pneumonia and influenza. Um, remember, avoid some certain drugs. There's some things on here. Generally speaking, um, the, remember the non-dihydropyridines we want to avoid. There's some antiarrhythmic drugs that are contraindicated in heart failure. We'll talk about those um, in a couple lectures here. NSAIDs. And uh, thiazolidinidione, which is a mouthful to say, that's a type 2 diabetes hypoglycemic oral agent. Don't care that you know that for this exam. You'll have to know it for diabetes during endocrine, but um, it is contraindicated for heart failure patient. It increases mortality. Um, NSAID use, so uh, like um, ibuprofen, naproxen use regularly, uh, is con it's physiologically antagonizing what you're trying to do with heart failure treatment. So you're trying to uh, promote decreases in afterload and preload, and you're trying to cause some vasodilation, take work off the heart. These decrease your body's natural prostaglandins, which is a vasodilator, and so you're working against that by giving somebody NSAIDs. NSAIDs are generally not recommended to be used, even PRN, for people um, with uh, heart failure. What you could recommend is Tylenol or acetaminophen. That's relatively well tolerated for heart failure patients. Not as effective, though, unfortunately. Okay, um, so preload and afterload. Preload volume entering the ventricles, afterload resistance left uh, ventricle must overcome to circulate blood. So basic concepts here, right? Um, treating underlying disease. Remember, hypertension gets treated naturally by treating heart failure. That's not something we have to worry about. 
Um, some of the other stuff here we'll get to, uh, valvular disease, surgical replacement, renovascular disease, you know, that stuff I'm not going to talk about, but it's possible comorbidities here. All right, first step, loop diuretics. We want to get rid of fluid. So if your patient is fluid overloaded, you can't really do anything. You've got to get them normalized before you can really treat the actual condition they have that caused them to be fluid overloaded. Fortunately, it's relatively easy to do this. You give them loop diuretics, and they're usually going to urinate a lot of fluid. Um, again, loop diuretics are highly potent. So you've got three options here. I've got the brand names on there. Um, Lasix is really common. I'm sure everyone in here has heard of Lasix at some point. If you didn't, now you have. Um, Lasix is uh, the older one. It's generic. It's relatively affordable. Um, a lot of people are familiar with dosing it. It's just a common one. The other ones are more useful for people who might have some resistance. They might be slightly more potent than Lasix, or they might have uh, like a somewhat different enough structure where they have added function to them. So like it, it's not like a one-to-one -one if you think about it that way. So torsamide and bumetanide are also quite a bit more potent. So for example, dosing's a little nebulous with these sometimes, but 40 milligrams of Lasix is equivalent to about 20 of torsamide is equivalent to about one milligram of bumetanide. And that's, that, that varies depending on the source, but that's essentially what it is. Um, some people will say it's different. But if you think about like bumetanide as one milligram is the same as 40 of Lasix, that gives you a lot more to work with when you're titrating somebody's bumex. Sure, you're not going to give them like, oh, let's give them 20 of bumex and just load them up. Um, but you can flex a little bit more with that dose because it's such a more potent drug where you seem to cap out on Lasix dosing if you push it really high. So that's where people might switch from one to the other. Um, it might be a tolerability thing too, like allergies, things like that. Um, usually taken once daily or twice daily. Most people take these in the morning. If you take them at night, you're usually going to spend the whole night urinating. Um, when people take these twice daily, it's important to, to let them know that this is okay. Most people take it this way, but um, to take one dose in the morning and one like early afternoon. Remember, these only last about a few hours, so don't wait until like dinner time or bedtime to take your second dose. So it's not the same as how we normally dose BID medications where we try and space them about 12 hours apart. We want all that fluid off during the day if possible. Um, sometimes patients will get creative with their uh, diuretic dosing. So if they take it BID or once daily and they maybe are going to be I don't know. I use an example of a patient I was just talking to. Um, she had to take a bus to go to like a concert or something during the day. Some like 93 year old lady. Anyway, she <laughs> she was on. I don't know why she's even on Lasix, but I think she has a little bit of kidney dysfunction. Anyway, so she um, she didn't take her morning Lasix dose, and she's like, oh yeah, sometimes I skip that one when I'm going out and about through the day. But I always take my afternoon one at 2 p.m. She missed her afternoon dose, and then she was in the ER. So that's how that goes. So it's really important to keep on these because even one missed Lasix dose can cause enough fluid accumulation to put you into an exacerbation where you get fluid backed up on the lungs, peripheral edema, ascites, things like that that are unpleasant and difficult to deal with and ultimately cause hospitalizations for a lot of patients. So that's what we see people coming back with a lot, not necessarily because they're non-compliant with their loop diuretic, it's just they might not be optimized or they might not be following their diet or things like that. They might have had way too much salt and they didn't up their diuretic dose and now it's too late, something like that. Lots of scenarios in which this can go wrong, but the, board, the underlying concept is that all patients on heart, with heart failure will almost always, I shouldn't say all, so I say most patients are going to be on a scheduled loop diuretic regimen. Every once in a while you see somebody with very mild heart failure symptoms who's on like, just take 20 milligrams of Lasix if you gain X number of pounds and they don't take it daily. Um, that could happen too if you optimize somebody's regimen enough, but the most uh, likely is they can be on a low dose of daily Lasix. That's pretty common to see like 10 or 20 milligrams of Lasix a day. There's no mortality benefits to loop diuretics. They're just quality of life and they just get rid of fluids. They allow your other drugs to do their job, um, but by themselves, they don't really do anything to help the heart. They don't remodel or anything like that. But from a quality of life perspective, they, they have a huge impact on patients. Uh, all right, never monotherapy. You're never just going to treat somebody with CHF with a diuretic. Uh, hopefully that's obvious, but you don't do that. Um, generally target weight loss one to two pounds per day until the weight is back to normal. If you aggressively diurese somebody, you can cause kidney issues really quickly. That's a recipe for acute kidney failure. Um, and then they're going to be in the hospital for a longer period of time than you had them originally. Um, so be patient with them. They do work very quickly and you can titrate them easily. You can give IV uh, loop diuretic too. You can do continuous infusions of loop diuretics. Um, so there's lots of options to get rid of fluids off people and do it in a controlled environment. <clears throat> 
Chronic therapy will likely require frequent adjustments and frequent monitoring. So we want to watch those electrolytes. Um, make sure your potassium is not getting too low. That's a big one with loop diuretics is wasted potassium. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Thiazides can be used sometimes in heart failure as synergy if you need extra um, diuresis. Usually you're looking at metolazone as being kind of an add-on. So let's say somebody's on a certain amount of Lasix every day and they have an option to take uh, 2.5 milligrams of metolazone on top of that if they gain you know X number of pounds. So three to five pound weight gain, take your normal Lasix, but take your metolazone on top of that. There can be some synergistic effects in the kidneys with that that can increase the diuretic potential versus just increasing the dose of the loop diuretic. It's a strategy. It's not a common one, but it's not not terrible to consider either. It's, it's, a, it's a decent alternative to just bumping somebody's loops way up. All right, ACE inhibitors, we talked about these a lot already. You get about a 25 to 50% decrease in mortality um, from optimizing ACE inhibitors. So huge benefit to heart failure patients by just being on an ACE inhibitor. ARBs do not have the same mortality benefit shown in trials. Some do show a decent mortality benefit. Other trials show that they actually don't have anywhere near an ACE inhibitor's benefit. So that's where it gets a little controversial. And people should always be on an ACE inhibitor if they're st at least tried on an ACE inhibitor. Now, if they get a cough or angioedema, you have to go down other roads than that, but you should give it a, a good effort to make the ACE inhibitor work for these patients. Uh, let's see, 30% decrease in hospitalizations with ACE inhibitor therapy, symptomatic quality of life improvements, improved patient sense of well-being. Um, usually improvement takes a few weeks to start to see. Whereas with hypertension, you get effects the same day you take the med for most of them. And usually it's like a week really to see the full effects of an antihypertensive agent. It's gonna take a longer, a lot longer for that heart to get back to normal. And several weeks in, you're probably gonna to start to see some of those effects starting to take place, but it's gonna be a long road for these patients to get back to a normal um, heart if they even can get back to fully normal, which is gonna be really difficult for a lot of people. But the best we can do is try and keep them out of the hospital, improve their quality of life, and improve the length of their life, which is what these drugs can do. Might not get you back to normal, but they might get you pretty close. Um, ACE inhibitors generally decrease afterload. That's how they work. Angiotensin II has some um, anti or some constrictive effects on the afterload side of things, and that's where this primarily works. Beta blockers uh, add on to ACE inhibitors. Similar benefits in goal. Big mortality benefits here: 35% decrease. Dosing limited based on bradycardic and hypotensive effects. This is the biggest challenge with heart failure management, I think, is getting that beta blocker. Usually, um, when it comes to optimizing dose, the beta blocker has better evidence for higher doses, whereas ACE inhibitors has pretty good evidence for like mid-range doses. So if you're optimizing doses, um, people will try and get on a really high beta blocker dose, and patients just don't always tolerate that. In fact, a lot of times, they, they just can't get on the ideal dose. But you try as best as you can. Get a decent drop in hospitalizations too. Symptomatic quality of life improvements again, and again, required therapy. So these two are, are absolutely required for left ventricular dysfunction. Talked about these three beta blockers already. Remember, metoprolol, and the brand name of the extended release is Toprol XL. It does come generically. It's been generic forever. Um, there is a different salt formulation. Um, I'm going to type it in here so you can write it, but I can write it up here. I'll spell it. Um, so... If you order metoprolol, so you're typing this into a computer system, metoprolol, metoprolol tartrate, T-A-R-T-R-A-T-E, is the immediate release. So that's low presser as a brand name. Um, so that's the one you don't want to do for heart failure. Metoprolol succinate, S-U-C-C-I-N-A-T, is the extended release. So it's a different salt formulation. That's really, I see this messed up more times than you guys can imagine. Like when people come in, it's a really easy one to screw up when you're entering it into a computer system because you just type in metoprolol, you find the 25 milligram dose, you click it, it goes in, you don't really think about it. Um, and then somebody like me comes along and I look at it, I'm like, well, I see from these outpatient records she's actually filling extended release at home, so why is it ordered as regular release? So that can be a big difference for heart failure patients. So just make sure you're clear on that when you're prescribing. Again, I'm not going to test you on that difference, but I do want you to know it for real life. It's a good thing to, to remember. Um, carvedilol and bisoprolol are the other two options. Remember, carvedilol and metoprolol by far and away are the two common ones. Uh, and again, targeting high doses, you're blocking sympathetic effects on the heart, decreases chances of ventricular arrhythmias, which will happen once that heart gets so expanded it can't beat anymore, really. You're going to get quivering and, and tachycardia and, and mostly fibrillation, which is going to cause death. Um, decreases vasoconstriction and heart rate as well, which also decreases workload on the heart.
And Carvedal has this alpha blockade, which has some afterload effects to it too, which is why generally, I'd say more often than not, it's preferred in heart failure. But certainly you can interchange them. There's not really good evidence to say use one over the other, but I do think people lean towards Carvedal. Um, aldosterone antagonists. So these have approval and use in all types of New York uh, classes above two and for ejection fractions less than 35%. And if somebody has left ventricular dysfunction immediately following a myocardial infarction, so that would mean like your EF is less than 40% immediately post MI, um, they do decrease mortality about 30% hospitalizations by 30%. So another really great medication um, that can improve symptoms, quality of life, and overall life expectancy for these patients. Spironolactone and eplerinone both are effective. They can be interchangeable. I say spironolactone is the advantage one here. It's more well studied. We have more experience with it, and it's more commonly used. Um, you do have to avoid these if somebody's got kidney issues. Substantially speaking, like serum creatinine greater than 2.5, creatinine clearance less than 30, and if their potassium is elevated above 5. Now, if they have acute kidney injury and you can get that resolved, you could, of course, prescribe this after that's done. Um, but if they're chronic kidney disease or dialysis or something like that, well, actually, dialysis one, well, yeah, dialysis might not be that. I shouldn't say that. We'll talk about that more during kidneys and talk about dialysis and how that impacts that. But just know that um, if, if it's a chronic picture where, they're, where they have these labs, that's something we want to probably avoid. If it's acute, you could resolve it and then prescribe the medication. Um, and then, again, the gynecomastia thing. Okay, digoxin. Digoxin's a new drug we didn't talk about yet. Really old drug, kind of a cool drug. It's a cardiac glycoside is the class it's in. It's the only drug that exists that I know that's a cardiac glycoside. <coughs> Excuse me. Mechanism of action it inhibits potassium sodium ATPase on the myocardial cells and promotes calcium influx and has a positive inotropic effect. So the cool thing about digoxin is it increases the, the force the heart beats, but it doesn't increase heart rate. It actually can decrease heart rate, so um, or stabilize heart rate, I should say. So it's a, a kind of an interesting drug because um, you don't want to increase heart rate with heart failure. That's working against a lot of things we just talked about. But being able to make the muscle cells pump a little harder to get more of the injection fraction up, that can be beneficial to the patients. However, as you might guess, there's not really any mortality benefits because that's really just a symptomatic improvement. So it works nicely to improve exercise tolerance and symptomatic relief. But generally speaking, um, it's not going to keep you out of the hospital or anything like that. So where it's used is a little bit debatable, and I'll touch base on that in the next slide here. Um, it is also renally adjusted, and uh, you can use it in poor renal function. You just have to space it out. Sometimes you'll see people on digoxin like every other day. That's not uncommon for somebody with bad kidney function. Um, role in therapy, class 2 to 4, really you could use it anywhere if you wanted to. If somebody's symptomatic despite optimized beta blocker ACE inhibitor therapy and probably on a spironolactone or aldosterone antagonist as well, you could consider DIG. It's not, uh, not I wouldn't say it's widely used, but it is commonly used. Not like everybody's going to be on digoxin, but you're going to see a fair amount of people taking it for this reason. Um, digoxin is fairly toxic. It's got a narrow therapeutic index. There's binding agents available to, to reverse it, but if you do overdose on it, you can have severe cardiac arrhythmias. So that's a problem, of course, especially if you're looking at people who have fluctuating kidney function, maybe if you get an acute kidney injury of some kind, if you overdiurese yourself, dehydrate yourself, you're popping your ACE inhibitors, that's a recipe for a digoxin toxicity picture. Um, so CV related, obviously going to be the big one here. These are working directly on myocardial cells. You're going to get arrhythmias and heart block. Um, you also get altered mental status and some CNS effects as well, hallucinations potentially. And visual disturbances is something people might see. Blurred vision or actually yellow vision. Monitor serum concentration. So we actually do blood levels on digoxin. It's the only drug, I think, well, we've talked about a couple, maybe antibiotics, but this is the only drug really in this area that we do blood levels on. Um, so five to seven days after starting or changing a dose, you want to get a level and make sure it's within a target range, which is 0.5 to 1.0. We also use digoxin as a rate control agent, sometimes for AFib patients, and we'll talk about that during arrhythmias. The levels and the, the targets is a little bit different. We usually target a little bit of a lower end of a, a therapeutic concentration for heart failure and a little bit of a higher end for, um, for AFib, but it's, it, they meet in the middle, so it's basically the same. Same dosing, really. Okay, this is my fun fact. Um, I don't... 
I've, I've read about this and it may or may not be true. I think it's a debatable fact, but I like it. So I'm going to tell the story anyway. So uh, Van Gogh went through what's called a yellow period of sorts. Anyway, he painted a lot of pictures in, in the same period of time with kind of yellow hues. Some people think that he was actually toxic on digoxin. The reason being is, um, well, he had some mental health issues, as most people who know anything about Van Gogh know. Um, but this is actually a, a portrait of one of his physicians, and it's a foxglove plant in the drawing itself. So was he being medicated with digoxin? I think historically digoxin has been used for various mental health conditions, not anymore, but when they, you know, back back when they had it. So and they weren't using digoxin like as a tablet, right? They were using more rudimentary methods to extract it from herbal medicine, but kind of an interesting sub-story uh, as it is. I like that one. So there you go. Um, okay, hydralazine isosorbide. Really quickly, this is brand name Bidil. It's got a role in therapy for African-American patients with New York Heart Association class 2 to 4. If they're already on a beta ACE and beta blocker, um, this can be added on to improve symptoms. Um, it can also be used in place of the ACE inhibitor for severe intolerance. And you could probably use that as maybe an option for a non-African-American patient, but there's not much evidence to support that. So like if you had a Caucasian or Asian person who wasn't doing well on an ACE inhibitor or got angioedema, could you use this as an alternative? Potentially, yeah. It's just the evidence is much more out there for whatever reason. I don't know if it was only studied in that patient population or ethnic group or that was the group subset within the clinical trials that responded. I don't know, um, but that's, that's what it's approved for. And that's what the guidelines recommended being used for. Okay, um, new therapy, Secubitril or Paradigm HF trial was the big landmark trial that came out with this. Did you guys talk about Entresto today? A little bit? Okay. A little bit. Okay, so Entresto is the new kid on the block. Um, Secubitril is the new drug. So, so notice that Entresto actually is a combination of Secubitril plus Valsartan. Um, and Secubitril was the novel drug here, and it inhibits something called Naprilocin. Um, Naprilocin is responsible for degradation of atrial and brain natriuretic peptide. Um, which has a number of effects on blood pressure lowering and sodium, sodium excretion. So it works on a separate mechanism of action. Um, one of the controversies of the Paradigm HF trial, and one of the reasons why I don't think Entresto has taken off like it should or theoretically should, is because all the patients in the trial were on a period of enalapril as a run-in before they started Entresto, which means that it's kind of a confounding uh, issue that you have ACE inhibitors being used at the same time and then switching. So the question is, where did the benefit come from? Are these patients benefit? Is the benefit seen because they're on ACE inhibitors, or is there really an actual benefit with this medication? It's really expensive. Um, it, I see a handful of patients on it here and there, uh, but certainly not not currently recommended by the guidelines to start over an ACE inhibitor, and um, not not taken off like it should, uh, or like it was thought to. I don't want to sound like I'm endorsing the medication because I'm kind of neutral on it. 3.7% um, absolute reduction in death from CV events. You might hear it advertised as having like a 30% reduction. I always like to put things in terms of absolute because it's more realistic. So when you look at everybody out there um, and look at how ACE inhibitors are, are effective for decreasing uh, all-cause mortality, um, you only have a 3% reduction of total patients who are in the trial. Now, yeah, if you compare it to how many people had events in the ACE inhibitor group, and that that's relative. And then, yeah, that looks a little bit better from a stats point of view. But from an absolute point of view, it's just it's not a super impressive number. However, it was a huge trial, well funded, uh, like 10,000 plus patients. So they were able to detect uh, statistical significance with that. So they significantly reduced mortality in heart failure patients compared to ACE inhibitors for the first time in decades. No drug has been able to do that. So that's pretty cool. Um, but at the same time, it's expensive, and it's not well understood where its place in therapy will be. The issue is you can't combine this product. So you can't like add it on to uh, an ACE inhibitor because you get increased risk of angioedema. Why they chose to couple it with Valsartan is a little bit of a mystery to me. I think it'd be interesting if they had more evidence just for Secubitril by itself and maybe in addition to, or as an alternative potentially to like angioedema ACE inhibitor, but you can't get that. So in its current form, all you can do is use it with the ARB combo. And if you have angioedema to ACEs or ARBs, you're, you're dead in the water to begin with. Not, not literally, but you know what I mean. Um, so I don't know where exactly we're going to see it. I, I don't know. Maybe we will see a Secubitril monotherapy or um, single pill at some point, but right now it's coupled with Belsartan, and that's the only way you can get it. Her pamphlet is handed out by their pharmaceutical, so this is their, like... Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So that's uh -huh. why they have it. By Novartis, yeah. 
Yep. So it's like the AR MI. Yep. So yeah, it's uh, I mean, it's kind of probably hurts them a little bit. The guidelines don't fully endorse their medication. Certainly, it, it it does have some functionality there. And if you have a patient who's not responding well to an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, and they're on good good dose, and they just don't seem to be getting better, absolutely, I think it's worth a shot. But from a starting perspective, I still I'm not buying into it, and the guidelines aren't either. Okay, let's quickly finish up some of these slides. Um, blood pressure, I've talked about this like too many times today. They aren't going to tolerate the doses. Blood pressure is not a big deal. If it is, you can add on little things, but you probably aren't going to have to. Um, cardiac remodeling, we already talked about that. Beta blockers and ACE inhibitors have the biggest impact on that. All right, diastolic heart failure virtually have nothing to say about this. It's very similar to what we've already talked about today. Control your hypertension. Um, control your tachycardia. So um, patients will oftentimes get elevated heart rate with diastolic heart failure. So that's a big difference between systolic. Um, treat them with beta block, or as far as like their symptoms presentation, you usually aren't going to see that as much with a, with a uh, systolic patient. Anyway, um, treat them with beta blockers, non-dihydropyridines, calcium channel blockers, or digoxin. So the drugs are all really similar to what we're doing already. Um, we haven't talked about nitrates yet. We'll talk about that when we talk about angina. Um, they basically vasodilate. That's pretty much it. Same drugs again. Here's some information on them. Um, for as far as evidence goes, ACEs reduce hospitalizations, improvement. Beta blockers and calcium channel blockers are primarily targeted towards symptomatic relief. They don't really have a mortality benefit. And digoxin doesn't really either, but may actually increase um, uh, chest pain or angina related admissions. Okay, we'll start um, next week, or I'll start recording some lectures 